Thanks everyone uh, for tuning in tonight. I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. My name is Kevin. I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's Books. And before we begin, I wanna encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. And if you don't already do so, please follow us on social medias, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, as well as our YouTube channel. Tonight, we're excited to welcome Simon Jacobs in conversation with Mona Awad. Something strange is happening to the teens in Adena, Ohio. A mysterious force is seeking inroads, vulnerabilities to exploit, friendships to hijack, untapped rage to harness toward its own ends. Who will it serve best? Claire is abrasive and aimless, embarrassed by her privileged upbringing. Weak-willed David is consumed by a recent breakup and harbors fantasies of violent cultish orgies. Greg silently wages war against the voices in his head while his sister Beth quietly goes mad. And at the center is the empathetic, naive, sensitive Sarah. The force wants her most of all. The question is whether she will be the key to its success or to its destruction. Eerie, hypnotic, and shot through with dark comedy, Simon Jacobs String Follow is a razor sharp suburban Gothic that cuts deep, exposing the sweating, bleeding truth of how kids become adults in 21st century America. Simon joins us tonight right here in Portland, and he'll be joined in conversation by Mona Awad, author of All's Well, Bunny, and 13 Ways of Looking at a Fat Girl. She's been a journalist, a food columnist, a bookseller, and assistant professor of creative writing at various universities. She's joining us tonight from Syracuse where she's currently teaching. This evening's event will also include an audience Q&A. Please use that Q&A button that you can find at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question at any time tonight. And if someone has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, you can even upvote that particular question. Perhaps most importantly, please support Simon and Powell's by purchasing a copy of String Follow from us. A link to buy the book as well as a link to buy Mona's books will be shared in the chat a couple of times this evening. Simon, Mona, we're so excited to welcome you tonight. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kevin and Mona. It's a delight to, uh, to, to be able to, to talk with you here. I'm really, Really, really excited about this, and you know, uh, sincere thanks to you and uh, for for doing this with me, and to Pals for for hosting it. I'm really, really excited. Um, so I thought I can uh, it would kick us off here to read you a little bit from from the book. We're just gonna go for a uh, we're just gonna dive right in here and do a little bit of a cold cold open before we head into some conversation. And uh, you know, you, I may, I will probably make repeat mention of my sweaty hands throughout this event. So you know, just prepare yourselves for lots of references to that. Um, so I'll, uh, yeah, I'll just kick us off here. The route to Sarah was easy, or should have been, because she spent a lot of time at Beth's house, and Beth had a spooky older brother named Greg who was into serial killers and chokeholds and shit. So he had a lot of contact and had laid a lot of groundwork without knowing it well before our arrival. Like he drift by Beth's bedroom where she and Sarah were hanging out and linger in the doorway. And when Beth wasn't looking, he'd blink and show Sarah he'd painted a set of eyes on his eyelids or he would pull up his sleeve to reveal the patterns he'd cut into his arm or would be mumbling what sounded like occult prayers when the three of them got into his car in the morning on the way to school. There was no consistency to it whatsoever. The idea was basically to project that there was some secret regimen of behaviors that Greg adhered to out of spiritual or small group obligation. And for a kid who mostly just hid in his room, consuming fringy internet era media and coming up with ways to alienate people slash himself, this was a pretty easy thing to do. Greg didn't have the context for this at the time, of course. He was just being himself, and his behavior was just that teen routine. But in retrospect, after the fact, 
These were the shapes it had that we gave it. Sarah took note. It was practically ingrained in her. She was carefree with her attention and love and only had to hear about someone's misfortune or depression before she hurled herself wholeheartedly into it. Her passion and talent was for being there, that's capitalized, until whatever problem became hers as well, impressively hers, so bone deep ran this empathy. She was the sort of person to whom, no matter how well you knew her, you could express the slightest sadness or upset, and she would commit hours to talking it through with you. Her time and warmth and attention would pool up around you until the problem had disintegrated within it. To those who liked her, Sarah was a girl of boundless enthusiasm and an open heart, a book that wanted to be read. To those who didn't, she was a dilettante, a passionate fool. She had brown hair that curled more the longer it got and was a beautiful soul. She seemed like the kind of girl who could be convinced to join a cult. She fell for it, of course. She started by asking Beth, whom we hadn't gotten to yet. And while Beth agreed that Greg was weird, as she always had, it was in a sisterly way and thus wasn't systematized. Sarah bounced from person to person in this manner until she talked to Claire, who herself was an agent of the dark and had, truth be told, her own separate agenda that was as yet unconnected to ours. Yeah, Claire said, skimming her eyes over the long line of cars waiting to exit the parking lot. It was second lunch period when sophomores and juniors ate and they were outside Adina High. The unlikely bond between the two of them had formed over a shared and wicked love of mid-2000s pop punk, which Sarah had developed before they were friendly, but after she learned of Claire's interest in pop punk. So she was genuinely passionate about it, but the passion had a larger goal. Anyway, Claire said, do you know anything about Half Blessed? I think I've heard the name, Sarah said, which was typically how she engaged with Claire's expansive cultural milieu. Claire, at present, had a shaggy Chelsea haircut that was dyed blue and wore a seasonal leather jacket whose pins changed daily, which lent her the kind of standoffish wisdom of someone who inhabits multiple eras. Had you asked Claire at this point, she wouldn't have called her and Sarah friends, exactly. Nor would she have admitted that her love for pop punk, a genre she had never experienced in its contemporary moment, was anything but ironic. Is that like a band, Sarah, Sarah asked. I guess it was a band after the fact, another common answer. There was always an obscure band buried somewhere, but it's more of a belief system, Claire said. A belief system, like some kind of religious thing? Claire shrugged. I mean, I guess, I guess as much as you consider iconography religious, she used air quotes. You'd see plenty of inverted crosses and whatnot, but they're not exactly burning churches, not in this decade anyway. She paused and bit her lip, seeming to consider. I guess it's more of a society, is how they would put it, with some magical overtones. Basically teenage Illuminati, but more social, like about ostracizing and status climbing, or like they'll squat your house and slaughter a pig in the living room, blind fires, stuff like that. Basically, it's just a, just a click with, uh, but with like secret handshakes and sex packs and blood rituals to appeal to the high school crowd. Obviously, Claire had lost sight of her answer to Sarah's question long before the words had finished leaving her mouth. But the important thing was that she had created a context for Sarah's future inquiries. Half blessed was a group thing. Stringent like a religion, but not a religion, and disregarding the rest, had pegged it with a few terms Sarah could use to propel her investigation further, namely sex pacts and blood rituals and something called blind fires. Was Greg part of it? Was that what made him act the way he did? After their lunch period ended at 12.52, Claire drifted off to trigonometry, which she called trigonometrics in the spirit of complication, pretty much having forgotten everything she said. While Sarah crossed the school's hypotenuse from the south to the west unit and climbed the stairs to her AP English class, where she embarked on further literary analysis and similarly traced dense passages of text for their older meanings. 
Coincidentally, for different reasons, during that same period, Beth's older brother Greg spread a wide swath of his own blood across the stall door in one of the first floor men's bathrooms. If one was dedicated to the cause, they could have found some geometry in it, or geometricates, that the bathroom, the very stall, was directly one floor below the seat in English where Sarah sat. But no one was making those connections at this point. I will leave you with. <laughs> that was so great. Uh, what a great was fun. Yeah, I love that section um, so much. I'm so glad you read it. Um, first of all, I just love this book. Um, <laughs> I think it's it's so brilliant and it's so scary and um, it's so mysterious and I've never read anything quite like it. Um, and the first time I read it, which was a couple of years ago, I got totally drawn in um, and this time again, just completely blown away by it. So those of you who haven't read it, you're, you're in for an experience, which is what I think reading should be. <laughs> you're in for an experience. Um, so just for the readers to be, um, I know Kevin kind of gave a bit of an overview and the reading also gives us a taste, but do you wanna just kind of set us up a bit, give us like a high level sort of overview of, um, of this world and the characters just to sort of orient us. So a sketch of where we are and who we're with. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, this book is about a group of southwestern Ohio teens uh, who, you know, sort of gradually uh, become enthralled by a mysterious and occult force that kind of winds its way through their community from person to person. So it's sort of a you know, sort of a coming of age novel via, you know, cosmic horror, sort of, <laughs> you know, so, you know, like a teen drama, but, you know, with, you know, horror, with a horrible outer force. <laughs> the way I like them best. Um, yeah, yeah, as, as, as one does, <laughs> as um, one comes of age. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Um, so I know this book went through a few different um, iterations. So what was, uh, and you shared this on Instagram, but I think it, it's it's kind of fun just to, to revisit. What was the first spark for you? Um, was it a sentence? Was it an image? Um, was it a scene? Yeah, that's a, that's a, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a fun, fun question. Uh, I think, so for me, when I start like a new writing project, for me, it really always starts with like a tone that I that I want to hit. And, you know, that or so I get a sentence or something and that will like inform a tone that I want to, you know, kind of expand into something. So in this case, I think when I the first thing I wrote for this book back in like 2016, uh, the first sentence that came to me was, Sarah was the kind of girl who could be convinced to join a cult, which you heard in that opening section from the book. So it, you know, that was the first thing I wrote of the book that was originally like the very first line. Um, and, you know, that that kind of, you know, this the section that I just read was pretty much like what I first wrote of the book. So you can kind of, you know, you can kind of see how I, I latched on to, you know, to that tone, which was sort of a, you know, sort of a, a like kind of wry and self-aware mm -hmm. and sort of like um, omniscient, but like still very closely observed. And yeah. like that sort of narrative perspective, you know, sort of came to me right off the bat. And then I think, you know, as I continued writing and it sort of gradually turned into a book I you know it, it was very much like an expansion of that like initial tone that I had and that kind of sentence and wanting to like explore and spend time in that perspective mm -hmm. um, so it sort of you know blossomed out from there I think initially I was like oh I want to write a story about a cult yeah and so I started it in that vein and then you know if you read the book it just sort of like, you know, that's like, that section is kind of a, you know, a little bit of a launch pad, but then it wanders off into so many other <laughs> directions from there. Um, so it's funny, it's funny to go back and see like how much of like the, 
you know, the, the opening pages or the beginning of the book kind of remains, you know, I don't know, has remained in place over these six years of fiddling with it. Yeah. Well, it's amazing that that section that was like, was there from the beginning, you know? Yeah, that's, it's funny how that happens. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Because, um, yeah, the, something about the tone, I think the tone is really one of the very special things about this book. Um, it's something I want to ask you about uh, a little later, but first I want to ask you about this exploration of violence um, mm. and uh, teens kind of falling prey to different kinds of, of, of violence. Um, you know, violence within friendship, um, within family, um, mm. romantic relationships, um, and then also just pain, chronic pain and um, mental illness. And then there's school shootings too, cults, um, elements of, of the punk scene. The book seems interested in where violence comes from and how we end up following one trajectory as opposed mm. to another. And how, how do we inch or how are we inched towards destruction, especially when we're young? And you were talking yeah. about coming of age novels. So I'm kind of wondering um, how did a coming of age narrative and the exploration of violence intersect for you? Yeah. Yeah, I, we, we live in, a, you know, I think growing up nowadays, you're really steeped in, you know, we're steeped in such a violent, you know, just such a violent culture, um, you know, that's so uh, pervasive and omnipresent. I think in a way that it wasn't even, you know, when I was a teenager, you know, 12, 15 years ago, yeah. Because there's so much more, you know, data out there because you're you're interacting, you know, you know, between like social media and like the internet, you're kind of you there's always been like, you know, horrible crimes being committed, you know, all the time and like, you know, in rampant institutional and interpersonal violence that you read about and experience on a, on a date, you know, that people read about and experience on a daily basis, but now it's just like in your face all the time, you know, it's constantly being filtered to you, you know, through, you know, Twitter or, you know, anything you're reading online, you just, there, there's just like, you're just pummeled with it relentlessly. If you spend, you know, as you, you know, if you spend time in the world with the, with the media in a way that, you know, you were a little bit more isolated from, you know, like when I was, when I was growing up that, you know, that just feels, yeah, just, I, you know, I keep using the word relentless, but I think that that's, that's sort of, I feel like that's sort of the way that it feels nowadays. And so I think in, you know, that has a disproportionate impact on you when you're a kid. Yeah. And I think what I wanted to explore in this book was like, you know, you have like, these little micro interactions or these sort of micro, you know, how these like tiny little interactions between people, you know, are, can be of the same, I don't know, can have those, those, you know, those kind of elements of violence to them to the same degree that some massive, you know, that some massively violent act can. Like it can have the same little, you know, little impact on you that like turns you in some way or like conditions you to, you know, that numbs you to subsequent violences or like, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of, teaches you a reaction to something similar like that down the line. So I feel like I was trying to, you know, write a book that sort of took place in that, you know, in this, in the, within this kind of ambient violence of, you know, 2022 yeah. or 2021, or, you know, I think the book is technically in 2017, I think is where, when it's okay. set. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's, I feel like it's, you know, it, it kind of, you know, that's the, that's the sort of culture, it's, it's, that's the sort of cultural moment that it's like trying to, you know, it's, it's our current cultural moment that it's trying to explore a little bit where, yeah, where it is just like, you know, it's more, it's much more deeply felt when you're, when you're a kid, like it's deeply felt in some ways, but also just like ambient in the world around you in ways that you, you know, don't notice at all. 
Well, so. you capture both. Like you totally capture both. You capture oh, awesome. that kind of like you know the the those minute subtle moments mm -hmm. um, between people, and then also those grander moments that you were describing. Both of them are in the book, and both of them I felt so sharply. They're so um, sharply um, explored and conjured. It's it's really amazing. Um, yeah. I'm thinking about that perspective of the sinister force. I mean, I'm I'm ascribing this sinister malevolence to it. Maybe maybe it maybe it doesn't have that, but I'm I'm definitely mm -hmm. seeing it that way because of the because of the tone. Um, that is observing and even entering the, the bodies, the heads of these characters. And um, I teach a horror class and sometimes we talk about how in film, um, you know, there, we use kind of like framing to disorient um, the viewer or to, to, to create like a sense of things just being unsettling, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how do we create that kind of disturbing, disorienting effect on the page? Um, right. And I was thinking about that with your book because the tone and the perspective is so powerfully creates that sense of unease, like this deep intimacy. But at the same time, it feels so mysterious and so scary mm. uh, because the the this this perspective is unknowable to us, is mysterious. Right. Uh, you talked a little bit about this when you talked about the the spark, but. I'm curious about what drew you toward this um, particular perspective to the story and, and if it felt risky to use it because it's unusual. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess like, I, I really like that point because I feel like there's nothing like so weird that happens in the book. You yeah. know, like I feel like I tried to keep it like fairly close, you know, at least by my, I don't know, by my yardstick, fairly, uh, you know, close to what, you know, reality looks like mm -hmm. these days. But, you know, but my, but I tried to render it in, you know, through this lens where it does feel so threatening and yeah. so kind of, you know, where the perspective feels threatening and kind of monstrous, um, you know, just because that's how the, that's how the characters who are going through it are experiencing it. So yeah. it's like, you know, a monster, you know, a, a, a monstrous time of life uh, presented in, you know, therefore in a monstrous way, even like, even though it, you know, is like more or less like, normal ex you know normal experiences um so uh, yeah I guess like so I really I definitely like like I guess it's like it's sort of like if you took yeah just like a domestic if you had like a domestic drama like like a you know a, like a movie or something like that and then you but you gave it to like you know a horror director to make <laughs> it becomes, you know, it becomes something else, you know, it's the angle that you, you know, shoot it at and the lighting that you use and like the, the soundtrack and stuff, you know, you just, you, uh, yeah, the, the, you know, the way that it's, you know, presented to the, to the viewer, to the reader, you know, if you do it through that sort of horror lens, it kind of like forces you to look at something in a, in a new, you know, in a different, in a different way, in a more horrific way than if it were just like, watching it presented to you straight on. So yeah. I, I like to play with that, you know, taking the the kind of omniscient, uh, dubious perspective uh, the book has was like a, an interesting way to, you know, to, to kind of manifest that. Yeah, I loved it. And I thought, I thought it was really very genius because it does create that, that effect, that, that kind of framing effect that horror, can, horror films can do. But on the page, and then with the intimacy of the page, mm. uh, I just I love that. Um, yes. One of the scariest things uh, about the book for me was that force and just the idea that we can be inhabited by something unknowable, and that that thing has a consciousness. Um, mm. It raises all kinds of philosophical questions about free will and and an idea of design and our understanding of the universe. When you said cosmic horror, I thought of that. It's the way the best horror does. Horror can be really mm. philosophical, but the book is also super visceral um, too. Um, 
So I'm thinking about just the way in which the book engages horror um, and what excites you about horror and to what degree was this book influenced by or shaped by your relationship to horror? Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, like a lot of the, I like that word visceral and I feel like that's like, like, like one of the things that I like about, you know, horror movies and horror media is that is is how visceral it is and how deeply felt it is. So I feel like, you know, it's a it's an intense book full of intense emotions. And so I really, you know, I want that to feel impactful for the reader. So, you know, I, you know, like if a, you know, uh so I, you know, I want the, you know, I want the characters to, you know, experience to experience what they're going through, you know, in their, you know, in their bodies, in their, you know, and to have that be very, you know, impactfully like presented on the page. So I feel like I take, you know, the 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 sort of shock and awe from, you know, from horror movies, you know, that that kind of, you know, do that in a very characteristic way. Um, and I feel like, you know, that some of the best, like, you know, some of the best horror movies or novels or you know really you know any any kind of horror media the best the best ones are things that are exploring some societal issue kind of through the you know the canted lens of 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 horror you know like a movie like like get out or you know right. hereditary or something like that you know uh so i i'm i'm really you know that th that kind of stuff really appeals to me i really like you know using genre tropes as like a vehicle to like you know, uh get you know get readers thinking about things in different you know in different ways or like as a way to lead people into something that they might not you know otherwise kind of engage in so i feel like that you know uh that that felt really resonant to me in writing um in writing this book and you know so i was thinking about you know yeah like movies like that or like you know, even I read, uh, you know, I read uh, It by Stephen King for the first time while I was writing this book. And that also, that I think yeah. that has a lot of problems and it's like 500 pages too long and it's all over the place, but it, it's like fundamental, like it's a, it's a really interesting story because it's about, you know, inter- you know, inter, it's a it's a coming of age story about you know intergenerational trauma. You know, and you know the you know the the, the you know uh, has a kind of a haunted town, and you know this like you know again this like this you know kind of violent cosmic force that you know recurs, and you know there's all this trauma that's passed down generation to to generation. Um, and so I was thinking, you know, I mean, I feel like. It's a really cool story, you know, wrapped up in a bunch of like some like truly like schlocky like horror stuff. And so I I feel like I was thinking about, you know, things like that, like just like, you know, you have um yeah, these sort of yeah, these like horror stories that are, you know, getting at something a lot more interesting. It, it like it is a lot more interesting than a book about like an evil clown. Like yeah. It, it's just like there's a lot more going on you know uh in it uh than that and so that's that's kind of the you know I like to I was I was very inspired by 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 stuff like that yeah I mean I we can talk a little bit about this now but um I was going to ask because I know that you are a David Bowie super fan um <laughs> did David Bowie in any way um shape this book um, as I know, we, we should definitely talk about punk um, after that, but mm. I'm curious about that. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Did David Bowie shift, shape this book? I feel like, um, you know, always. So da David Bowie is like my, I would say my like primary artistic influence. And if you like, if I think about any, any like cultural thing that I like, Mm -hmm. I can trace some lineage of it back to David Bowie because he was like a really, you know, a formative, you know, uh, like musical, you know, figure for me. And then, you know, he, part of the reason that he's so cool is that he was so, you know, he was like kind of involved in like 
every kind of media. You know, he was not only like kind of consistently ahead of the game musically, but he was also like, you know, he was in movies. He was like, you know, drawing from all of these like experimental writers, you know, in his work, uh, you know, uh, visual artists as well, like costuming, theater, like um, really, you know, all over the place. So you can, you know, there's a whole, you know, a, a universe of, you know, Bowie, you know, constellate, you know, uh, cultural constellations that I, you know, I'm, I'm perpetually, you know, picking down uh, right. stars from. So, and, and I feel like his, his last album, uh, Black Star, which came out, you know, two, two days before he died, um, you know, I would say if I had to pick one of, you know, one thing that he created that was an influence to this, it was definitely, it was definitely Black Star because that, um, that album, like, it's just full of like, you know, this very cryptic, like symbolism and imagery. And, you know, that's really like, you know, it's super, super evocative. It's got great videos. It's got, you know, it's like this weird, like jazzy art rock album that has like all these like very tender ballads on it. There's like a song that's you know, that's in, you know, clockwork orange language. And then there's, you know, the lead single is like this 10 minute, you know, weird experimental thing that has like a very odd, you know, like a real surreal video attached to it. It's just, I really love it as an artistic statement. And I feel like, so I listened to that a lot while I was, uh, you know, while I was writing this book and, you know, I, so I, I feel like I appreciated, you know, especially I, excuse me, I appreciated the album on so many levels, especially as like an artistic statement, like his last sort of artistic statement that he made, you know, yeah. he was, you know, dying. Um, so I really like it, you know, I feel, I think like kind of aesthetically, it definitely like had an influence on the book and like, you know, my interest in like filling the book with like weird symbols and cryptic noise, some of which is meaningful, some of which is just nonsense, you know, and just, you know, help it, having that contribute to the world that the characters occupy where everything, you know, is both a sign and like not a sign and like everything has the potential to be like charged with meaning, but equally could just be like a random, you know, a random thing. Um, and so I feel like that it definitely like speaks to like the you know the heightened the heightened place of you know where all the characters are operating where you know there's all you know you feel you're surrounded by things that have meaning if only you could reach out and, yeah. it and figure out what it is yeah no i can definitely see black star in the book and those symbols that you're talking about that i love mm. um, i love all the patterning and all of the symbols mm. well, yeah that was fun fun to yeah <laughs> It was, it's, it's really, it's really, and, and very unsettling, like very, very frightening too. Um, there's something about design. I don't know, maybe it's just something that terrifies me. There's just something about the idea that I don't have free will. Um, yeah. That is so terrifying that I think this book plays with, with its, with, with its language of symbols, with, with the perspective in so many different ways. And I just, I love that because it is such a fundamental fear. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, I just think it's great. Oh, uh, so yeah, let's, let's talk because soon I'm going to turn it over to questions. So anybody who has a question, please drop it in your, uh, the Q&A and I'll definitely try to get to it. Um, but I want to ask about punk because punk plays a huge role in the story. One of the characters, Graham, is the lead singer of a, of a punk band called Viceroy. Um, and some of the some of the kids in the story are in the punk scene, so I'm I'm curious, what is it about punk that lent itself to this particular story for you? Mm, yeah, I, it's a you know it's a scene that you know attracts uh, you know people who feel otherwise from their normal community, right. and I think that that's a you know uh, while many of the characters in this book are like rich uh, you know are kind of like rich white entitled kids like I think they're you know there's there's a you know an, 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 an otherness that you know exists within many of the characters in the book including some of those um you know that that kind of 
you know, I think think informs that. And you know, southern uh, you know, southern Ohio and Indiana has a you know a rich rich lineage of hardcore and punk rock. So it was like fun to you know you know write these like versions of uh, these like alternate versions of you know spots that I you know spots that I knew uh like growing up and you know I think like you know more so less less so for me as like a you know young teen in Ohio and more you know more sort of as I was getting older I was more kind of into the you know into the you know punk and hardcore scene and stuff like that but I feel like that it, I feel like that the you know that kind of community where you have you know with like um yeah uh, what's what am I trying to say uh I don't know it, a kind of community that's like you know sort of uh that you can find like all over you know kind of like all over the place in sort of ad hoc spaces you know like doing shows in like you know someone's basement or like you know a church you know assembly hall or like a vfw hall or something like that like i feel like those those sort of like casual like transitional spaces where like you know where punk rock like exists and stuff like those are the spaces that i was really interested in like in exploring uh, the sort of like deinstitutional, like deinstitutionalized spaces. Uh, that I was like really interested in, like writing about those and like you know using using those spaces as like a way to, you know, uh, as a place to like hide from like the you know, uh, you, you know, from the 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 crazy super institutional you know ambient violence that I keep talking about. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah that's, it, that's kind of where that came from. <laughs> it is a place, it is a place to do exactly that. Is there, is there for you, I mean, thinking about the setting, it being in the Midwest and it being set in Ohio and in the suburbs, um, is there a, a particularly resonant relationship for you between punk and, and the suburbs? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think if you grew up in the suburbs, you know, punk can kind of seem to you like sort of a, uh, it just feels a lot more a part like it's a how to how to articulate this I mean I feel like you know if you're a kid growing up in the suburbs you're like the cool thing is like going into the city and you know, like there are like punk spaces that exist in the city but I think like punk is like the you know it's the kind of thing where like some of like the best punk is like yeah it is like those shows that are like in like some kids like parents basement or like that are not like it's not like downtown whatever that may be but it's like at you know it, it, it's like at some foreign legion hall like off like the highway like behind, you know in a strip mall or something like that so it's like you know these spaces that can thrive and exist you know in the suburbs you know and that's sort of part of you know how they I don't know that that that's like an important part of that community is people kind of you know coming to it through that through. yeah yeah and the suburbs are so so sleepy too where they can feel so much like death punk <laughs> sort of feels like a scream against that yeah yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah um okay before we move on to questions um from from um the audience i'll just ask a bit about process because i know this book mm. like i was saying in the beginning went through a few different iterations what was the experience of writing it like and what was the most exciting thing about it yeah i uh so it's a book that you know i i write very slowly um and this 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 book was has been a really interesting because you know I've published a couple of books before but this was the one that I think had the most other people read it before it like made it out into the world and you know it's a very different book being published now via you know MCD FSG than it would have been had I you know published it from the manuscript that I thought I was done with in 2017 um, and I think. Uh, uh, so as, you know, as 
it's been, you know, kind of read and processed, whether that was, you know, by, uh, by Bill, uh, who's, who's my, who's, you know, I had like a small group of friends, like read it. And, you know, when I was first finished with it, and my mom, who's also a novelist, you know, and, you know, no, often knows what I'm saying a lot more particularly than I do. Um, you know, so I had like a group of people, people read it. And then, you know, eventually it got to, to Bill and the Clegg Agency and, you know, who, you know, kind of uh, helped me work on it too. And the, 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 you know, up until it got, you know, sold to MCD at uh, FSG. And then, you know, I had uh, Daphne and Lydia, my, you know, kind of editorial team there uh, helping me work on it too. And the theme across all of those revisions had really been uh, kind of expanding the canvas and finding more ways to let the readers in. Mm -hmm. uh, I think because I'm such a, you know, solitary writer, for the most part, I spend a lot of, you know, time in my head. And so, you know, I think the first draft of anything that I write is really, is really insular. And, you know, I think can be hard, for, hard to get into. And, you know, I, I like to play my cards like close to the vest. And, you know, I'm like, you know, I love, you know, I love oblique art that like, you know, you, that gives you nothing that you have yeah. to bring everything to and so I'm like well this is the book that I wrote and like you, know, you don't like it like yeah yeah like it's not for you um right. but you know which is you know not super productive so I think like you know as I've had other readers you know uh kind of weighing into it they've helped me kind of crack the book open and turn it from this very like you know this sort of relentlessly dark thing, you know, into a much more kind of spacious and wide ranging book that allows like the characters to breathe and it gives like there's, you know, some levity, limited levity and, you know, so, you know, it kind of spotlights the, you know, the kind of hopefulness that I think is there, but that which, you know, was not as visible, you know, previously or, you know, in its, in its earlier form. So I feel like, you know, most of the time you talk to a writer and they're like, yeah, you know, my first draft of the book was was 200,000 words. And, you know, by the time it published, it was 80,000 words. You know, they cut 75% right. of it. My experience was like the opposite. Like the first version that I, you know, that I thought I was done with was like 60,000 words and now the book is 100,000 words. So it's really like, like who does that? Like it's nonsense, but <laughs> that's, you know, so, so that's, that's been my experience. I've had to like, you know, kind of open, open the book and myself up as I've, uh, you know, as it's moved through development. And that's, I think, been the single most gratifying part of the process really. Yeah, well, it never falters in, in terms of voice, in terms of the world that it's conjuring, it never falters. It's so fully committed to itself. It's, it's amazing. You would never Thank think you. that it went through so many um, iterations that you were opening and opening it up because I think you knew it. It's just there, the voice feels so organic. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's really wonderful. Um, so I'm gonna just go to the, um, to the Q and A here. Um, Okay, so we've got four questions. Um, the first is from Anonymous. Hello, Anonymous. Um, in as much as there are universalities to growing up, but also regional idiosyncrasies, um, how much did um, Southwest Ohio inform String Follow? Yeah, I think Southwest Ohio informed it because that was where I grew. That was where I grew up. That's the sort of day-to-day -day experience that is most, you know, familiar to me and what I end up, I feel, I think, writing about the most. So I was really drawing from my own, uh, from my own experience there, and it was really, you know, it's fun to do because, you know, I can kind of map things that I knew into into other things. So this is like sort of my. You know, so the so the book is very you know assertively and um, you know uh, is very assertively like set in the same kinds of like you know 
the suburbs in the same you know region where I grew up. So that that's a very deep and fundamental part of me. And so that was a uh, you know I think as far as setting you know, it really, it really influenced it and like gave me, um, you know, I think a lot of the, the joy in the process was in sort of mapping some spaces that were very familiar to me to characters in the book. Um, and I think like the, you know, the, the sort of, I don't know, the kinds of kids that I was interested in exploring were, you know, I don't know, like I said, I, I like took you know, some of the characters are like, you know, a lot, there's a, you know, kind of a, a big, a, you know, a, a real class kind of range yes. um, to the cast. And I think that that was, that was really interesting for me to explore. And I think like taking it for, from the suburban angle made it, you know, more, more interesting for me to, to kind of grapple with. So. Yeah, I love, I love all the different characters and yeah, how fully you inhabit each one. And they all feel different from each other, which is amazing given how many you have. It's, it's only more over time. <laughs> yeah. like adding more people. Yeah, but they're, they're, it's cool. great. Um, okay, so there's a question from Martha Moody. Um, My mother. <laughs> I, think <it's> <laughs> um, I think as an adult, a person can forget how shocking um, certain realizations are to young people. The college party, for example, in your book is terrifying but it's just a basic frat party. How did you get back to the feeling of first discovering such things? Yeah, this is a real Simon doesn't like parties. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it, 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 I feel like that it speaks to one of the points we were talking about. Um, we were talking about earlier where like, you know, the lens through which you write something really informs the reader's experience of it. So like, yeah, there's like a frat party in the, you know, in the novel. Right. You know, the kids who are going to it don't totally recognize it as such and it, you know, it, but it's like, you know, it's kind of an alienating and visceral and frightening experience just, you know, because, because it's kind of like, rend it's, it's kind of rendered in an alien and, you know, uh, overwhelming, overwhelming way because that's how it feels to like the characters yeah. at a time, at, at the time, you know, it's like, you know, when you're, yeah, so, uh, you know, I tried to, like, I don't know, yeah, like, there, I feel like, again, I feel like there's just, like, there's a lot of, like, you know, a lot of bad things that happen in the book, but not, like, uniquely bad things, like, just, like, you know, I feel, you know, routine, routine pain, there's, yeah, there's this, there's this great album by uh, Spanish Love Songs, and they, uh, the first track on it is called Routine Pain, and I, I, I feel like I think I think about that phrase a lot because I feel like the book the book is like very focused on kind of like yeah on this like sort of routine daily you know kind of experience but it's just like you know sometimes rendering that in a in a way that feels you know, very very alien and overwhelming because that's how it feels sometimes even if you're doing a totally normal yeah. day, like riding the bus. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah, those bus scenes. I still remember. I actually remember them for the first time I read it. One of the bus scenes. I, yeah. I remembered and when I came back, I was so glad that it was still there because it was, it's really, <laughs> I mean, I, it brought back memories of writing. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. The bus um, scene. And then I add, I think between the time that you read it for the first and the second time, I added another bus scene, you know, I was like, oh, let's give Mona another bus scene. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I, need, I need more than that. Um, okay, from David, um, David Kambu. Do you have a character you feel closest to? Is it a different character than you would have felt closest to as a teen? Well, that's a great question. That's a good, yeah, that is a good question. Yeah. I think my allegiances change. Well, not my allegiances. Like, I love all the characters in the book. I mean, some of them are like, you know, more you know, they're problematic faves, um, you know, but I think, I think the character that I feel closest to personally now is probably Tyler, who's like, I think starts as like the least, yeah. the person who's least easy to sympathize with, and maybe the reason that is because, like, I can't honestly, you know, thinking back, I don't really remember how much I did or did not, like, 
you know, kind of change his, you know, how much of his character, his character has been pretty consistent throughout the course of the book. But again, I think he's a good example of like where, you know, you don't have a lot of insight into that character. You know, you, there was probably a lot less insight into that character, um, you know, uh, in earlier drafts of the book. And I sort of cracked him open a little bit and, you know, uh, gave readers a little bit more insight into, you know, his, you know, his, his reality and what his mind is like, um, you know, and for those who have not read the book, Tyler is a character who sort of just, who just moves in, who moves in unknown into his friend's basement and sort of takes it, takes it over and just yeah. is there for the course of the, the novel, um, you know, oh doing God. assholey things to his friend. <laughs> It's, it's a source of great tension in the book, for sure. Um, one of the many sources of tension. Um, I love Greg. I love yeah, Greg. That's that, good. I, the other yeah. bus scene that I love Greg. Yeah, that, yeah that's a, I was pleased. I'm, yeah. um, that's a pandemic scene. I remember right when I wrote that one. I, I, I like that scene, too. But now I'm like forgetting all the characters that because yeah. I think I would change my, change my answer, but <laughs> um, controversial okay. answer. Well, it's okay. It's your book. Um, so Graham, um, Graham um, Nissen, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, your early writing was focused on shorter stories and String Follow is about 500 pages. Um, did you start off intending to write a longer novel? And um, if how does your early short story writing factor into String Follow? Well, Graham, uh, you know, I think 500 pages, like, it's a little, it's a little much. It's not 500 pages, sir. Um, you know, 400 pages. Um, but I think that that's a fun, that's a fun question because when I start writing something, I don't, I never really know what shape it's ultimately going to take. When I started String Follow, I was like, I'm going to write. You know, I said this earlier, but I was like, I'm going to write a story about a cult. And so I thought it was going to be a short story, and then as I just kind of kept writing it, I was like, okay, this will be maybe a novella. You know, that's the thing, people, right? And, you know, then it just kept, you know, kind of going and going until it wound down. And then I was like, okay, it was 60,000 words. I guess it's like technically a novel. And then it's only gotten longer over time. So, you know, I think I've never, you know, I haven't, I've written, you know, I, I started mostly writing short, you know, short fiction. And then even my first novel, I think, started life as like a short, you know, a short story that I then, that again, had a tone that I was really into and wanted to play with more. Um, so uh, yeah, so for me, it really, it really has just varied over, you know, over time and kind of, you know, I, I feel it out with each, with each project, so. Yeah, it's the only way that you can do it really. Um, yeah. Especially if your way in is is tone, you know, mm. the yeah. tone to tell you the shape of the book. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What's your What's your experience, Mona? Have you Do you go in with a novel in in mind or a, a format in mind? Um, no, I think I think it's similar to to what you were describing. It's more like um, some kind of obsession or fixation. Um, so, like, mm -hmm. just. A, to what you're talking about um but that that obsession or fixation will will spark a tone will spark a voice and then that's that's what i'll follow um so yeah usually just something that consumes me i end up exploring it in fiction yeah yeah um, we have a great question that i want to make sure we get to i had it in my list and i didn't i didn't get to it um how did you arrive at the title string follow um, I think in the beginning uh, of your comments, you alluded to it vaguely. I looked it up and I know it's a term from archery, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, I wonder about the title and its you know, relationship to the, to the story. It makes some sense based on what I read um, about string follow, yeah. Yeah, so, so it, it, uh, it, is, it is an archery term. And basically what, what string follow is, is like when you have a bow, and you know, pulling the string back to fire an arrow, the more you do that, it causes the the you know wooden part of the bow, like the tips of the bow, to gradually 
um, bend inwards over time to kind of follow, you know, to, to follow the string. So that's called string follow. So, uh, so the term like originates from there, uh, but I feel like it also, you know, I think about, uh, it also conjures to me kind of the, the image of like a bunch of people kind of following each other along a string, you know, kind of being guided by like a string in the dark sort of, you know, like, uh, you know, kind of following each other successively, like along a, along like a string. And uh, so, yeah, so those those are a couple of the, the inspirations for the for the title. Because I think like, you know, string follow, like as a, you know, as an archery concept, it's like, you know, doing the same thing over and over and over again, eventually it warps the instrument. So, right. and that's kind of like, you know, one of the themes of the book, I think. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, it's brilliant. Um, and also just that, just, I didn't know about um, the, the, the archery, um, but when I when I first saw that title, um, it scared me right away, and I think that that's good. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. it's always it's, been the title. It's always been the title. You never okay. Yeah. When did you know? That's a good question. I would have to consult my notebooks to see when I, because like when I'm writing it, I like will put you know the the name of uh, you know in the corner of the page so I know like what project I'm working on in that given page and so I when I started the book or when I started it, it was just you know cult and I was you know, I was writing on my little cult story and eventually that changed to you know to SF uh, but I don't know I don't know at what point that did that but I think it must have been kind of early on because I feel like I've had you know and I, I had like an idea of what I wanted to do pretty early into the process. So I would say at the time that I decided it was going to be a novel, I probably settled on that, on that name. Yeah, it's, it's, it kind of tells you what it wants to be called, I think. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah for sure. Okay, we have two more questions. Um, let's, yeah. uh, I don't know how much time we have left, but um, I'll ask you this one because I think it's a bit shorter. Um, what are you writing now? Hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a good question, Bill. I feel like I have a couple of uh, I don't know yet. Like I'm, you know, I have I have a few unreliable narrators I'm perpetually like toying with. I, you know, I haven't. Uh, so I, I don't know what's gonna I don't know what's gonna come next. I feel like you know my my sort of working style thus far has been to do, you know, wanting to do something very different with each, you know, with each project. So I feel myself drawn in like a more sort of, you know, more, you know, maybe naturalistic or sort of magical realism kind of direction. But then I also find myself drawn back to, you know, troubled teens in the Midwest. So, you know, I, I, I can't seem to break myself free. So I don't know, I don't know yet, hmm. have to see. Maybe you need both. Maybe you yeah, need yeah, I need both. Yeah, I, that's that's story of my life is like being like, oh, I have these three disparate ideas, but what if I tie <laughs> them all together? <laughs> well, that's 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 the that's the genius, right? Bringing them all. Free. Yeah, I guess uh, you know, a book within a book within a book. Inevitably, I'll do that. Like like yeah. something like that. I feel like it's toying with me. I love a I love a meta narrative. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I feel like you do too. I do. Or from your work. <laughs> um, I, I picked up uh, Palaces, so I'm excited to read that too. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah that's a fun one. Yeah. I, yeah, I, that, that's an, an, another, it's like, that's, that's like a very transparent, you know, tonal experiment where I'm like, oh, second person, like what fun. <laughs> it just really doubled down on that one. <laughs> Well, thank you both so much for tonight's talk, Simon. This is his book here, String Follow. Sign okay. copies. Yeah. Sign Sign copies copies for our house. And signed a bunch of copies for us. So if you order the book, uh, I'm going to put the link in the chat right now. Click on that link and get a signed copy of Simon's book. Mona's got a few books. This is her newest one, all as well. It's amazing. And you should buy that one in, in stuff line. That's right. That's right. And also, uh, 
this event is going to be showing up on our YouTube channel. If you're not familiar with that, I just put the link in the chat for that as well. Click on that. You can check out all of our uh, events that we've been doing on Zoom. Um, and the this event will probably be showing up there sometime tomorrow. So if you have friends that missed it and want to share it with them, uh, please do. Um, uh, once again, Simon and Mona, everyone at home as well, thanks a lot for tuning in and have a great night. Okay. And thank you. Thank you all for joining. And thank you. Thank you so much, Mona, for doing this with me. Uh, this was so much fun. And Kevin and Tina, thank you for hosting this via PALS. Uh, it's really exciting to, yeah, it's exciting to be able to, to do this. So I'm really excited to have the book into the world. And thank you for making it feel so special. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was such a pleasure. Uh, I loved it. Everybody go buy it. Um, thank, you, thank you so much, Pals, for hosting us. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everyone.